My name is Robert Ramey. Uh, you'll know me as the author of the Boost uh, Serialization Library. My topic, the title of my talk today is, Is Boost Broken? Uh, it's deliberately provocative in the hope that we would generate a lot of interest. And I'm kind of disappointed that we have a lot of empty seats, but maybe we'll fill in later. Uh, I think I came into Boost about eight years ago. Uh, the minute I saw it, I was enthralled with it, I should say. Uh, also, uh, I've become I'm a huge fan of C++. I think that C++, to progress, needs more libraries. Uh, I think Boost is the main provider of quality libraries for C++. I think it's been very successful. And actually, I think the main thesis of my talk, that to some extent, it's a victim of its own success. Uh, I tried to get a little information on how <laughs> successful it's been, or it's some real hard data. I was pretty much unsuccessful. The only thing I was able to find was this from sourceforge.net, uh, which showed the number of downloads uh, going back, uh, well, almost 10 years. And I don't know how accurate those are or how those have been affected by the fact that we increased the frequency of our releases or whatever. But, you know, you don't really need to draw, you can draw from that, it looks like something is happening here. Uh, that looks exponential, and uh, that also sort of jives with what my intuitive feeling is. And so, that's pretty much all I have. I don't know if anybody else has any other real information in that regard, but there it is. It looks almost... Well, that's a good point. Because the library's got much bigger. Well, if you, if actually, if, if you ask me, when I look at this, but then I don't see anything purple on here. So, I don't know what... I, don't, <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't start drawing conclusions from this, except for the fact that it just seems there's more movement in it, in quite a bit. I, and I frankly, I don't really need much more of a fact. I wouldn't even need this fact to convince myself that it's going on. That's the only thing I can find. That's the only reason that it's there. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, a boost, the creation of a boost library, we're, we're all familiar with what's involved. Uh, somebody proposes it on the list, and then they, people talk about it back and forth. And uh, somebody uploads a zip file with uh, their idea of a library. It goes into the vault. Some people download it, and then they go back and forth a long time. Uh, somebody wants, and then this particular author uh, wants to get it in the queue or wants to get it formally reviewed. Um, and then if, if it gets accepted, it's tested on a regular basis and deployed as part of the boost package. And then the uh, library author maintains it. Not too much uh, that we don't know about there. So. Uh, I look at just look at the reviews, and follow the list, and uh, it seems to me the number of libraries we can get reviewed is more or less constant, or doesn't change nearly as much as the number of people that are proposing libraries. Uh, and I think this is a perception, or at least my perception, that it takes a long time between the time that something, even something that really looks ready or interesting, between the time it's submitted and the time that it can actually get out there. Uh, so the, the uh, that's <coughs> we don't so we don't have enough reviews. That's a problem. I think <laughs> one reason it's a heck of a lot of work to review a library. It's work on the part of the uh, person who's <laughs> selected or cajoled or convinced to become the review manager, uh, <coughs> and it's even a lot of work for the people who do the reviews. They have to set out time. You need to sit down and do even a halfway decent review of something. To, it's going to take you at least a whole work day. And uh, then it's only by coincidence, and, and typically, um, a lot of these times we have a review, there's only five, six, seven reviewers involved in total. And if you think about it, uh, it's not, I would like to see more. Uh, to, it just seems to me that we have a lot hinging on relatively few people. In some cases, there have been libraries proposed for review, and Ed was one. Uh, they only got one review, so the whole, there was a review manager, and uh, they put the two-week period out. They only got one review, and he said, basically, I, 
I, the review was positive, but I just couldn't see accepting as an official Boost library, a library on the basis of one review. Uh, even if there's enough reviews, when I look through the reviews, uh, to start with, they're pretty good, but they're as much as a person can do in one day or two. They, uh, they base mostly review the documentation and the design. There isn't a lot of time to, uh, to test the implementation, to look into the code, to really bring it out. Even a boost library that's already working just perfect, if I download it, it takes me like almost a week to kind of get the feel, to figure out the documentation, get a feel whether it's going to be useful for me, et cetera, et cetera. And that's one that's already been certified as, as, a, as a boost library. And so the review process kind of misses. It's just, I think it could be better and if it were uh, changed around a little bit. So uh, normally, I don't really review a library until I need it. And you know, it just would be the most <coughs> grandest of coincidences that just the moment I needed it and was willing to spend that amount of time, that they're going to have a review for that library. It just doesn't happen. So, so what I'm, uh, so what I really would like to see the review process have more information available in order to which, in, in, in order to, to base a decision. So. What I would like to see is uh, the discussion and the whole rigmarole that goes around is, is pretty much uh, the same as it is now. Finally, somebody says, okay, I want to propose my library. And uh, of course, we don't, it's not, the queue is too long, you couldn't get it reviewed anyway. But I want to define a procedure called acceptance. And a procedure called acceptance would be that a person has his, what he thinks is, the next great boost library, and he has, he has it to a minimum level. It doesn't have all the features it's going to have. Uh, it's not going to maybe deal with everything it should, but it illustrates what he wants to do, and it has some useful functionality. Uh, maybe the, uh, when I did the serialization library, I went through 23 versions in the vault. The very first ones didn't were much simpler. Didn't have uh, things like being able to serialize something through a base class pointer. But if I, even that first version, or those first versions, could do something useful for some people, and also provided a, a vehicle by which I could get feedback, and uh, people could, could test, the, uh, test the library, and some people, uh, even an early version, put it to use and, and made use of it. And so, uh, in order, so I would like to see that uh, we have a process whereby one can submit a library and the only, there, there wouldn't be any judgment as to whether it's appropriate for a boost library, whether the quality is there, whether it conflicts with something else. It would really have to fulfill just these requirements. You have to have a boost license. Uh, it has to be a portable C++ library or tool. Um, it, would ha it, has to, it would have to play nice with the other boost stuff, in other words, it, couldn't have the same name as something that's already in there or, or whatever. Have to include a, a build or deployment system. Uh, and uh, at this point, we've got two that are uh, we use. One is uh, BJAM and the other is CTEST. I would let the uh, library. Excuse me? CMake. CMake. Yeah, that's what I meant. CMake, CTEST. Actually, I'm confused on that. So. Uh, it's a, well, it's appropriate, actually, that you're confused. We'll, I, I think we'll be able to clear that up a little bit tomorrow night. But in any way, uh, the analogy from, I actually use BJAM. Uh, it's worked well for me. Uh, I could say something about that. But the, the long and the short of it is that um, it's worked well for me. Uh, Vladimir's always been there when I have a question. So, you know, and it's the kind of thing that if it works, I don't really want to know anything more about it. So. Uh, but I do believe that you know, people have preferences, some people have. There's no real reason why a, 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 that, we, that we really, that, that every library has to use exactly the same tool for doing this build. Um, it, should include, it should include all the stuff that a Boost library has, uh, tests and demos, should have usable HTML documentation, and it should install and test on, in two environments. So the first question was, how is this list is who's going to build this check? 
the, the, okay, so there's two people involved so far. There's the person who wants to submit the library. We know who that is. That's, uh, <laughs> and there would be somebody who would basically verify that this submission meets these minimum requirements. Hopefully, that's a, re that's a relatively routine proposition. That's, well, they're designed to be not subjective. Well, at this point, is this uh, kind of work for the review manager? So you have to throw together the review manager, then? No, I, actually, I would anticipate a, a, a permanent a person that would be designated, that maybe the recurrent review manager or somebody else. When somebody makes a submission, the guy checks it off. Does it, it's basically, does it meet the checklist? So I don't, I envision that not be, he doesn't make it, take a decision, he doesn't analyze it, he doesn't make a judgment about it, he just, he just sees whether it's in enough form so that it could be evaluated. And I, I believe that that should be a relatively, of course it's always a simple task when I expect someone else to do it. But uh, the fact is that I do believe that that's a definable task that can be done in a definable amount of time, and as I say specifically, that it's not, it's pretty much objective, does it meet the criteria or does it not? Is it testable? Is it evaluatable? Yes or no? In order to meet that, it should do this. I don't think that's a very hugely high bar. Well, there are some statements here that are subject to like usable implementation, like... Um, Excuse me? Like some statements in the, in the list were sub subject, right? Like well, usable documentation. Usable, you know, that's, a, that's a, okay, that's true. Usable documentation, but honestly, is, is that something that would be really controversial. I, you know, go ahead. Uh, just for context, uh, there's a CPAN, which is a repository for uh, uh, Python, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, Perl, Perl. And, uh, in order to upload something to CPAN, you have to package it. And uh, the packagers enforce certain requirements that it has documentation, tests, the, uh, you know, well, tests. I didn't know that, but yeah. hey, you know, great minds think alike, huh? Uh, that's, to me, the same idea. And, but I'm saying it's all automated, right? Well, in order, in order to t turn it into a, a package that you can upload, it has to be in a certain form. Well, you know, I suppose it could be automated, but honestly, I don't. In, I don't expect us to be inundated with hundreds of libraries a month. I think, matter of fact, if this is a requirement, uh, because right now the requirement is a lot more lax, and we get a couple submissions a month. But if you have to pass this bar, it's not a high bar, but it's a higher bar than we have now. Uh, you know, if it was one a month, do you, do you not think that there would be somebody who could, uh, you know, subject uh, to to, uh, to apply this criteria one time a month? I don't think it's a big a big obstacle. Yeah, uh, this goes about libraries which are speci especially made for boost. There are also libraries which are uh, generic, etc., and might be gone into boost, but you don't know. You only know if it's accepted. So if you uh, want to uh, apply the whole boost structure and it's rejected, you, you can... Uh, well, th so this is, th you're right. And this is, this is a fundamental difference between the current system and what I'm proposing. I'm saying if you want to make it a boost library, you will have to invest more effort to make it look like a boost library. Uh, you, can't, you, you won't be able to get a real re review. You won't get people to be able to evaluate it and test it and compare it unless you meet that, this minimum standard. So in a sense, we are raising the bar a little bit. But honestly, I think we have to do that in order to move forward from where we are now. One thing that specifically that I don't want to require is I don't think that it should be, that it should be required that the library com be complete. I could easily envision a guy proposes something and it's got all these functions, but he only has the three basic ones working right now. But that would give me enough to know whether the guy's on the right track. So is this, are you proposing this system as a cure for not enough reviewers? Uh, I'm proposing this system to improve the review process because as, as we'll see in a moment, I believe that this will generate a lot more information in order to facilitate the review and make the review itself um, um, an easier process and more effective. So do, can you give me a simple answer? Do you think it will will have more reviewers if we adopt this? Yes. Okay. Okay, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Um, so when a library is accepted, uh, we right now we have the sandbox, we have um, uh, the vault, 
uh, one or the other. I don't know. Uh, and some people have, I guess they're, some people just leave them on their website or whatever. <clears throat> the boost guidelines says it should be put in a zip file in the vault. But in any case, what I envision is that if it passed acceptance, then we, then th if the person has met this standard, then we would open up a branch uh, on, the, on the SVN tree or whatever. And then, because a lot of us can find it accessible in that manner. And at that point, he's already passed a minimum standard. We'll be able to open up a, a spot for him on there. So the, uh, his library status page is uh, key. We'll talk about that in one second. But uh, at that point, the library is available for download by anybody who wants to evaluate. Uh, the, people will, what, what, what some people will do, and I found myself in this situation, I need a library, I look to Boost, it's not there. Uh, uh, singleton. And uh, last time I did that, and then there was a singleton in the queue. And then it went through formal review. But, and then it didn't get approved. And then it disappeared. So uh, I can envision situations where there are libraries I might decide that I want to use, even though they haven't passed the official Boost thing. But they do have at least a minimum level, which permits me to evaluate them and some tests. I may, at that point, look into it more carefully, and uh, at that point, uh, I'll decide whether or not to use it or decide not to use it. Thanks, John. I'm getting, from my personal perspective, I mean, I'm getting the feeling that you are using some arbitrary areas. The library develops all the strokes. You start with idea. Okay? You start some implementation, probably some point, some development for the implementation, some additional unit tests. And uh, the source control is only grounded at the very last point. What if I want to share this work with the developers? Well, okay, what if somebody. I uh, want to show some limitations where I don't have the well, limitations. Well, this is kind of an interesting point, because to me, this is a problem. Uh, if you're making a library, and, it, it, and it, it, it has, it's not done yet, there's two ways it can not be done. It can be working, but not complete, or it can have a lot of bugs in it. And, and it can be complete and have a lot of bugs, or it can be incomplete and have a lot of bugs. And I found, honestly speaking, if I go out and look for libraries on the, uh, or the net or code or available code to solve a problem, I find, honestly, too many times I get some code, it looks good, I start to work with it, and then all of a sudden, there's, it doesn't have any tests, so then I kind of just start looking, and I've got a guy who thinks he has a library, and it just has a couple bugs in it. And honestly, that really sours me. I would much rather have something that meets what you call an arbitrary standard, and at least some minimal standard in which I, I think that if a person can't meet this minimal standard, he doesn't have a reasonable expectation to be able to make a library that's good at eventually introduced. That's my honest opinion. Well, I mean, this is a discrepancy between your expectations between you and what you see on the on lower page. And you see, if you, instead of seeing a single page that says this is a zip file, and you expect this is something that you can use, or imagine that you may, it would have a status, as you just described, it says in development or status, test is ready, documentation is ready, to me, else is ready. I don't, to me, the status is that no known bugs, but not complete. If I, I frankly, if I'm downloading a library to that I might consider actually using, that's what I want to see. Well, there are different reasons for both of them. Well, I'm telling you what my reason is. So, I, and I, I believe that the, the claim to fame of Boost, the important thing, the thing that makes Boost different is the quality of the, of the things that are on there. And uh, that's why anybody who needs a library, most people that need a library are going to turn to, to Boost first because it's the most, it's the likeliest place you're going to find something that you can depend on. Uh, if I'm looking for a library, it's not because I'm really interested in spending time developing or looking bugs. I'm actually looking <laughs> to save some work. And even if it's not complete, if, it's, if it doesn't have what I want, fine. I lost, ten, I lost half an hour. If it purports to have what I want, but then it has side effects and it doesn't work in that compiler or bugs and obscurities, uh, then I'm really bent. And by the way, that library isn't going any farther, as far as I'm concerned, just because uh, I already invested enough time and my attitude's bad. So I think that by, by holding developers to this minimal standard, we're doing them a favor. 
I really believe that. So, uh, now a key thing uh, to this process, I mean, my real motivation here uh, isn't to stick it to developers, and it isn't, it's really to have this library in kind of a standard form or, or, or uh, to, to meet this checklist. And then when this library is accepted, we open up uh, basically a, a library status page for each, each library. Uh, this particular one, or at least the part up here that I took, is already on the wiki for the Concept Freights Library, which was submitted, and then, and then in this, uh, C++0x came out, and then, or was going to come out, and they decided to abandon it, and now, of course, well, maybe it's interesting again. But in uh, any case, uh, I envision a, a, the, a library status page, which looked pretty much the same, in the same format as uh, every other library status page. It's almost a form that, as a matter of fact, it would be generated by a form that, that the, li the, the submitter fills out. And it would have the stuff you see here, the basic stuff at the beginning. Uh, <laughs> the state abandoned I got, that was already on the page. Uh, and some basic statistics. If it's last up uploaded in 2004, that kind of tells me something now, especially if you're in, in 2010. Uh, gives me a little description of what it is. And a key thing is also, it gives me a list of the other library, other blues <coughs> libraries that it depends upon. So uh, farther down, let's see what else is on here. Okay. Uh, it also basically gathers some statistics for this thing. It tells me uh, the number of people that have downloaded it, uh, the number of people that ran the test successfully, the number of people that ran the test that, uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, this is just statistical information, the number of times that people build the document. Actually, that shouldn't be here because I concluded it should come with HTML documentation, so that's not an issue. The time it was last updated, the time it was last downloaded, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, that should be built and maintained automatically. And right away, that's just interesting information right there. If I see the thing has got a thousand downloads, huh, well right away that tells me that that might be interesting to look at. If nobody's downloaded at all, that tells me, uh, you know, I've got nothing to go on. Um, some uh, other information which personally I think is important, the number of tests in the, the uh, package, the number of things that fed or fail or whatever. Here's a button to download the, the, uh, the library. And uh, this is every time, if when I download, I download the library, I want every library to include the tests, and I also want almost somehow to enforce or strongly encourage that whoever downloads the library runs the test suite on his environment right then. Uh, I like to be able, if I download something, I like to see the test, and I like to run the test right off the bat. Especially, I think. I think given the way your personal library's tests are written, you wouldn't have any users if you wanted them to do, the, to do that, because it would take forever. I and think that the possibility that somebody submits a library with 250 tests, I think it's extremely unlikely. So I don't, I'm honestly speaking, if that occurs, we'll deal with it. But I honestly, I, I, my concern is more the opposite. That a guy will tell me that it's tested and it only has three tests. Uh, if somebody like loads one up and it, it, it runs 250 tests, uh, give me a call. We'll deal with it then. But, I mean, doesn't how many how many individual tests? If you include all the build configurations that you're testing for serialization, how many tests do you do? Well, I mean, uh, it's a, it's a let, lot. It's a, and it takes a long time. Okay. Well, to start with, when you, when uh, that's true. And, but I I think that the serialization library. I want to talk. If, if we want to talk about that. I want to talk about it separately. But I think generally speaking, as far as the number of tests being run, the serialization of the library is not typical. And uh, the amount of time it takes to run, I don't think with a serialization library, it's typical. I think also for a particular person, if I download a library, I will likely just build it for my own one compiler that I happen to have on hand, and probably just one or two build configurations, debug and release at the most. As a practical matter, I know that when people download the library, or when they post something on the user list, a large number of times, they haven't run the test suite at all on their machine. Even if that machine or compiler has never even 
doesn't even show up on the boost test matrix. So I would like to see the idea that if you install a library, that part of the, the obligation is to run the tests on it and verify that they've run. And it's actually, as part of that procedure, I really like to see those results uploaded back up into this page. I, and for most libraries, especially most that are recently, the running the test is a couple minutes. I don't see it's a big burden. But where's the motivation to do so? Well, there's, <laughs> uh, that's a good question. You know, um, I'm here, I'm here to make the pitch, and we'll have to see how it takes. But uh, I think that one motivation would be is when somebody goes into uh, asks for help on the library, if if they haven't run the test, I don't help them. That's what I, if, if, if they have a question which uh, suggests, and that happens a lot of times, somebody says, it doesn't link. Well, that tells me that their build environment is probably not something I expect. And the, our answer is, well, we can't help you until it links. Run the test. Or if some guy says, uh, this facility doesn't work. And I say, you run tests such and such. Well, no. So you run that test and get back to me. So I, I believe, unless the thing works perfectly right out of the box and nobody has a complaint, we'll have a little bit of leverage to, to, to insist upon the tests. I don't, I've never considered the test as doing the thing a library user does. I know, it's, it's, and I think, I, and, and that's one thing I want to change. Yeah, Be, but I don't agree with it. Okay, that's <laughs> fine. Uh, but, and there's one thing that, there's one aspect of this which I, I think is very important. We run the tests, we have a, a bunch of testers, do a great job, and they test on the platforms that they have. But we, that's one set of platforms. But that's a disjoint set, set of platforms than the ones that users are actually using. So if so a guy has a, a Windows CE system, or QNX, or VXWorks, well, we don't have it, uh, anybody running those tests. Re you require the users to have VGEM or CMake? Which uh, they don't have probably. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Well, uh, not they may not necessarily want to use them at all. They want to use their own build system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, whatever. You know, I'm, I, this the gentleman asked, how do we motivate people to actually run those tests? The truth is, I'm sure that as as important as I think it is, a certain number of people will decide that they don't want to do it. We're in agreement there. Well, you know, if even so, two, even if it was two percent, that would be a heck of a lot more testing than we're getting done now, and also on all the platforms that people are actually using it on. But it's odd to me, you know, you mentioned that that, that I, you're going to download a piece of code from some guy you never heard of, and it's not even been subjected to the boost testing apparatus. It comes with a test suite. You're thinking of incorporating it into your code, maybe production code, but. You're not going to take the time to just run the tests that come with it? Not really. I'll probably start with the documentation. What? I'll, I'll probably start with the documentation. Then you won't run the tests? Well, see, we're like different that. in that regard. Uh, point of order. Uh, the, the title of the talk is, you know, is Boost broken? And you put your finger on, like, one aspect in, in which Boost is uh, broken, and I agree with you, the review process kind of uh, is, is in need of help. What I was really hoping to get out of the talk is uh, to find uh, and now we're kind of like uh, lost in details of your uh, proposed fix. Uh, I want to know what other people think is broken about Boost and uh, have some brainstorm about uh, ways to fix it. Well, I think that uh, I think that's a motivating factor for a lot of people to come. And I'm making a specific proposal which will be subject to criticism. And I think that it's good to have to use that as a vehicle in order to as a MacGuffin or a, a framework or whatever you want to, and you know, everyone will have an opportunity to uh, to criticize the, the aspects of my proposal and propose their alternatives. But I think it's instead of having just a, I'm, what we have on the mailing list are people raising all these issues in sort of a disjoint way, and here we have an outline and a framework, and then we can go through the points one by one. These are my proposals. Uh, I made the proposal to make the talk. It was accepted. I had some reservations, but now I'm doing it. And uh, I think that even if uh, my particular proposals are not favorable, and it's extremely unlikely that everybody would agree with me on any of these points, uh, I think it will serve as a good vehicle to, for everybody to propose an alternative. How's that sound? Okay. Okay? Okie doke.
So um, I also would like a little, uh, I would expect if, if a library goes, well, let's just suppose for the sake of argument that somebody proposed to uh, upload it at another singleton library. And since it's a pattern that a lot of people use from time to time, and people often turn to Boost for it, I would expect a certain number of downloads. I would expect a certain number of tests. I would expect a certain number of people to, to feel, be very happy with it. I'd expect a certain number of people to be really disappointed with it in some way. I'd expect a certain number of people to have no problem with it. I'd expect a certain number of people to find that in their situation that they, they call it from a DLL and it doesn't, it has surprising behavior. Or, or some people call it from a multitasking system, it has surprising behavior. And then I would expect them to post a complaint on to, uh, I would, and, that, and then they would decide to either use it or continue to use it or not use it. And they would have the opportunity to uh, display their satisfaction or ire by basically rating this library uh, based on some uh, axes or attributes, which would be just easy to indicate whether I was happy with it or not happy with it or whatever. Uh, you know, we'll see. Uh, you know, I, I think that's I think it's a worthy idea. I I think that uh, it would also be interesting to me if I thinking about downloading an area a, a, a library and 100 people downloaded it and they all said it was terrible. Uh, that would really save me a lot of time right there. Okay. So what I see you proposing looks like a, a pretty nice infrastructure for a certain part of of what Boost does, um, and. So the first thing that, that comes to mind is, uh, did you look at you know, what else is out there? What other kind of, has somebody already built something that does 80% of this? Well. Or have you looked at the other, the other I, things? Because there's a lot of stuff out there. I, there is, and you know, I have to tell you, I haven't looked, in, I haven't done an exhaustive uh, search of, of how this might be implemented. I did, I have, because what we're talking about is two things. What I, I'd like to see is what I feel is necessary, and the other thing is how to do it. And uh, how to do it is a separate little phase here. And that would really be a question of how would we make use of either what we have or what's available. OK, well, the reason, uh, there's two reasons to ask about whether you've looked at things. One is to know if you know how to do it. But the other one is to, to ask whether you've, you've thought of like all of the possible things you might want have in this proposal and, and consider how they're treated in real work, real practice and stuff like well, that. Well, I so. have to be, I have to, my satisfaction with it, okay. of course that will be up to you to decide whether or not that's satisfactory. I'm sort of curious how your rating system is going to describe the versions of Boost because all of those points will change from release to release. Ah. The library can be pretty terrible to be under the performance of one release. Okay. Remember one thing, this is actually for a library, for all libraries, whether even ones that have just been recently accepted. I'm actually less concerned about libraries which have already been reviewed because they're frankly known to be high quality. I really But that's not the case because the, after a library is accepted in Google, the maintainer is free to go and change it in any way they want. Now, well, let me ask the question a different way. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, this rating system. Your question suggests to me that this rating system is too naive or is not sophisticated enough. Well, it might be lying. Yeah. Well, that could be. And then if it, we found or if it was determined or uh, that it was not uh, useful, then of course we wouldn't include it or we would exclude it. I think that you know it's it's we just have to be experimented with to see whether whether it's attractive. I have to tell you honestly where I got the, what motivated me for this is. <laughs> looking for a book on Amazon.com uh, because I find that it's just really, uh, if I'm looking at a book, I can't really thumb through it very well. But the, the user reviews and the user ratings, I recognize they're just, they're a crude measure, but they're better than nothing. And I do actually read them and use them to help me make a decision. And I would, that's kind of the model which I'm looking at here. Well, just taking an example, because it's all completely missed point. Uh, have you had this question? Even that library, which was already that, forget about that, consider that this being proposed, it goes to 100 to emissions. I mean, not like grocery regional, like 100 to 99. That's for point number one. Second, point number two, uh, all this applies like, security. You know, no one can measure, track who knows. Finally, the last point is the 
like any voting system, it's like yes and no. If you uh, ten people in, during review say no, I don't like this library. One person says, oh, I like it, and because of that, that, and that. So you wouldn't you wouldn't find the user rating uh, interesting idea. And what if somebody felt that it was? Would you think would you prohibit them from uh, using it? No, I just don't. Okay, well that's fine. It's a free country. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, I've got the impression that we're going into the details of this process. Right. Really we're moving. And I'd like to propose to split it a bit. Something like there's a proposal to have something like a testing stage or to, to get more reviews, right. to, to get something in place that people actually using, getting interested in libraries, maybe working, submitting patches or something, using it and then on the by writing reviews. And let's talk about metrics and uh, voting systems and stuff Those like are details. Data. But I think the most important thing is this splitting of the process into two parts. Gathering information is what we're lo looking at here. And then the re and hopefully by the time it comes to do a review, a lot of information would already be available. People who had the, needed the library and investigated will have had the opportunity to post their review and feelings about it long before the official review process. By the time the review comes, hopefully there should be, you know, 100 downloads. And hopefully there should be 20 people who uh, they posted their own review already on the list indicating whether they think this would be a great boost library or this thing was just more trouble than it's worth or it's got a lot of problems or whatever. But the problem now is we do a review and then everybody has to scramble to try and do something and, and we don't get enough information. And that's what I'm attempting to address here. I'm trying to propose a method whereby we gather information as it's convenient to generate, like when I test or run a library. And we keep that information here, and then it's available when it comes time to review. I, I, and I think that if you, if you think about the, or you look at the review process that we do, uh, I, you know, to me, this makes a lot of sense. So, uh, but I think this is a good idea. I don't want to, I'm happy to take questions, but, you know, whether this page included a rating system or not, to me, is almost inconsequential in the scheme of things we're talking about. Is, is this a meant to uh, replace the formal reviews? No, no, no. Okay, then, then, how does it, is it going to help us get more for more reviews? I mean, if a user is seeing this, how is it going to give him the wish to, for, to write a formal review? I fail to understand this point. Well, now that's interesting. Why you're you're saying that people don't have to give a review? Then why do they give <coughs> reviews now? Is, is this is a point that my, my, my people give reviews because they like to have their say. Uh, and, on the other, and on the other hand, that the number of people that are ready to give a review when the review is there is, is a small number. This would permit people to have their say at the moment they have something to say, and that information would not be lost. It's also that in that stage when you know, okay, it's not formally accepted, then you'd expect that if you say something like, oh, couldn't you change the design in this and that way, that you actually can do that. Once the library is fully accepted and in there, then the compatibility and stability of the API and all those issues appear. In that stage, you get uh, something like a beta program for a compiler, for example. If you participate in that, you expect that you can still get changes in. And we don't have it now. I mean, every library stays in the, in the queue for at least six months to one year. You have more than enough time to address good, it. Good point. But the thing is, the information's all over the place. We don't have it centralized. We don't have any statistics. And then when it comes to do the review, it's like starting from scratch. I, I, I see a lot of value in the direction you're going. I mean, it seems like, um, if I just think about what happens if you get a, a library out into use and, you, and there's a, a platform for people to start, start working with it, if you know that the thing has a community, a thriving community, say, it's like it's almost a no-brainer to accept it into Boost. I mean, obviously, you want to you want to do some vetting, but in um, the contrary, too. Let's suppose but, somebody puts something up there and it only has ten downloads, and, and one guy was so ticked off, you put a negative thing. Why bother going through the review? Sure, but I'm thinking of like like for example, Asia was was almost a no-brainer for us to accept into Boost. It was it was a mature library already, and that kind of thing happens on you know 
on its own. You have, the question is, does, should Boost be providing, the, the next question I have is, should Boost be providing the platform for that kind of community building or not? Well, I, I, uh, how should I say, I believe that it's, that, that platform has to exist somewhere. Whether who does it is kind of a different question. Well, <clears throat> I, I agree with you that it has to exist. Why wouldn't we want to do that? <laughs> Don't we have enough on our hands? I think, I mean, Boost has a lot of problems. That's what, you know, one of the things that, that Robert's there, there, There's two, two, two issues here. One is, what kind, what do we need? What do we need done? And the other question is, how do we go about getting it done? I kind of like, I want to try and maintain those as separate, if that's possible, because mm -hmm. uh, they're both sticky questions. And on the other hand, you really, it, it, until you come to have some sort of consensus about what we need done, it, talking about how we're going to do it is just like, yeah. really becomes tedious. So uh, here I made my little graph about uh, how I see the Moose process being slightly modified. We got developers cooking up their next uh, PhD of resistance, and that gets uh, submitted, that gets, they, they, it meets the, the minimal boost guidelines and it gets submitted. There's some sort of cursory review, I'm not sure what we want to call it, acceptance review. Uh, this should not be a huge burdensome job. Users start to download that uh, library, start to use it, we start to get feedback on it, uh, it we, here's the statistics thing, here are people start posting their own reviews. Uh, people will post reviews uh, if they've actually spent time working with something. I know that from my experience with the first versions of the serial, serialization library. People actually want to help and contribute if they have a good framework for doing so. Uh, I don't think there'll be any problem. Uh, I don't think there'll be problem with people running the tests if they believe that that will be appreciated. Uh, and then I also believe that people will be uh, willing to submit reviews uh, even though before the review period, if they've been using the library and, happy, and they're happy with it. And as I say, I look at Amazon.com, that's, that's to me the, the model in that regard. Uh, so then, then finally, we'll get to the formal review process, and which is, I don't see, I don't envision any, I don't really envision any change at all. I think the formal re review process is the, the one of the two distinguishing factors which makes Boots really different. And the way it's structured, I, I felt that from the beginning, I don't think that should change one bit. The only difference I see is that the review manager, he'll have a lot more to draw on now. And uh, in matter of fact, many of the disputes that occur during the review process are speculative. Huh? They talk about design issues, and they talk about uh, whether uh, this is a problem, and they kind of get off onto tangents. Well, but, once, but a lot of that discussion is eliminated if you have real data. Uh, like, I tried, because of the, the way it's designed, I couldn't, I couldn't interface it into the ASIO system. Or, you know, some people will have real anecdotal information about whether the design issues helped them or hindered them. Now, it's really very speculative in a lot of cases. And, of course, speculative discussions sometimes turn into, well, you know, the, the, the long arguments are almost always due to the fact that there's not enough facts. And hopefully, <laughs> by providing more facts, that, that would shorten the process. And it would also mean, right away, if you've got uh, 10, 10 libraries there and you, it's been subjected to this process, I can guarantee you, start with seven of them, it's immediately obvious they're not ready for this. It's just, I know that we're drawing more libraries. A lot of them are not really up to snuff. That will be obvious. There'll be one of them, which is such an obvious no-brainer to accept. There'll be a review, but given the information, it'll be almost almost a formality. And then there'll be, uh, uh, you know, one that, that is, that has a lot of contention. But by that point, we will have done the equivalent of 10 reviews and only spent really one long pr review process on one. Uh, go ahead. Um, I, I like the way that you're thinking about this. I think it would help a lot. But the problem with the Amazon model is that when you buy something on Amazon, the product is done. With, with these kind of libraries, there's a, it's a moving target. And I think any system that doesn't incorporate well, uh, that is... Well, okay, and, and let's, I'll go back to my point before. I'll, I'll make a proposal here, and we can talk about the details, but I, the, I think the main point I want to get is the concept of this two-stage process to, in order to gain information. Yeah, but, you, but you, I mean, it, it can't be a two-stage process because 
th there is that interaction there. So you need to have that users back to the developers, back to the users. The, the, of course, the developer, when he gets on some negative feedback, people gonna, he's going to go back and do another iteration. But that's, right. that's, 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 that doesn't really change our process. That just delays the, the review process from my perspective. It just sits there and cooks that much longer. Well, would he have to re go through reacceptance? Well, remember, he's got an ESPA. No, no, he wouldn't have to do that. He can he can keep making changes until everybody's satisfied with it. It just sits there. It might take him a year. It might take him two. He might never get it done. Or you know. What do you say? Well, go ahead. What's your question? Okay, so I think one thing that was This library. Uh, okay, this library. stop right there. Okay, let's just let. Suppose you call what you call a pre-review. I call the period of time between the time it's accepted and the time that it's subjected to formal review. Yeah, but there's so much stuff that gets uploaded into the vault that when I look at the vault, I don't know what's good and what's not. If there are libraries which are actually, you know, if actually I knew that a bunch of people looked at this library and said, well, you know, it looks so sort of interesting. Um, yeah. This gentleman in the orange outfit. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, Go ahead. I know what he means. If, if, if you have a way to where you can collect reviews without the formal review process, why do you need a formal review process? Because someone needs to really evaluate all that information. What, what can, why can't that be done I mean, without, without being in a two-week set period of time? Once you get enough high-quality reviews, well, you know, you're asking, me to, right, you're asking me to predict the future. I believe that once all this information is available, then it'll become obvious that there's some easy change in ways to make things simpler. But I don't have to go there yet, because we'll have to get well, here first. Why not? Well, I don't, I don't know yet. Because at some point you need to direct people's attention to it, to say, hey, we really need to focus on this and decide whether it's accepted or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. Otherwise, yes. people will have no reason to go looking for it or to evaluate it. Is what's going to happen. You, even though it's accepted, I don't see you have any reason to go with that. But my point was that, that even though the original premise wasn't broken, let's list it again. It's not broken. We reviews too short. We review, the review manager is difficult to find. We review too many a little small amount of libraries. I don't see this changes too much. Maybe okay, well, then we're going to disagree. Yes. Um, I am, uh, one important point is that if people want to contribute, if they have the opportunity, if it's kind of easy, if there is a good framework to do so. I think that, that is a very important point. Uh, currently, it is the case that uh, you, you must um, send to the boost mailing list, and reading what happens there can be intimidating. And not everyone feels uh, ready to, to join the list. Um, and many people might have in important information and might uh, give good uh, reviews that do not want to join the boost mailing list. Okay. So these people should have uh, the possibility to, to give their contribution and they will do so if, if they have a good, uh, easy framework. Well, you're preaching to the choir. I, believe, I agree. So here's the, uh, by the time we get to the formal review, I think I've already touched upon this stuff. The re formal review hopefully should have a lot more information at its, disposal, a lot at its disposal, a lot more relevant information. If there isn't enough information, well, hey, we're, we're not going to do the formal review yet because, uh, you know, we're going to wait, we're going to spend the time doing something where we know we have the information already. So this will make the formal reviews more relevant, more efficient, and more effective. Um, 
Okay, and uh, the only if the only difference is that if an, if the if the review manager goes through the process, pretty similar to this now. Hopefully, it should be less painful, but wouldn't be a heck of a lot different. The only thing he does is is he changes the library status page. All of that stays exactly the same. Nothing changes. It just gets changed to a burst boost certified library, which means it's going to be part of the boost distribution. But other than that, there's there's no real. Uh, there's no real change. If he decides not to accept it, it doesn't get eliminated, it just stays there. People, get, a lot of times libraries are rejected because they don't have enough features, but they would be useful to someone or for whatever reason. I have no, uh, we know that it meets at least some minimal standard, and I, I'm so happy to leave it there. It could be reactivated at a later time, like what about the concept traits library? Now, given the passage of time and the events, maybe, maybe it takes another look. Here you have good points, but you're missing one. When you write review, be the same as now. And that is a problem. If it will be the same as now, I still don't see why you would get more reviews. So you said something interesting. You said they want to give reviews because they want to have their say. So the one, logically, the ones who don't give reviews don't want to have their say. No, it's well, not wait, true. wait, wait, wait. I, I follow them. So the question is, why don't they want to have their say? So see, I, I disagree with your premise. It's not that people don't want to have their say. It's that having your say takes a lot of effort. And during the review period, you don't have the time. If I'm using the library, okay. then I have, then I've done the work. Yeah, I, I, I will, if you will let me finish my sentence. So you said they want to have their say. So from what the ones who don't want to have their say, I had the experience not long ago. So I would like to also know what the other new library writers had if they had the same one. I usually I see several kinds of people. There are the ones who don't like the library. This ones I don't hear about them because nobody's going to write me. I hate your library, go away. So this one is rare. <laughs> Never happened. Usually I get the ones who tell me, oh, I'm very sorry, I completely missed the review because it was short. It happens. And many of them, most of them, are people who are telling me, I would like to, to give a review, I just don't dare. I and I think this, this is a problem. You're missing this point. You are very well, good proposals. I don't, uh, You're missing exactly this okay. point. This, this may be a problem, I'm not addressing that here. Actually, I think, I think your proposal actually does address the intimidation issue. Um, partly, yes. Uh, partly, because, because people are much more likely to be willing to express themselves in a form that consists of people that are concerned with the same domain that they're, that they're worried about than to go out into the sort of wilds of the whole boost review community and, and put themselves, make themselves a target. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, I, I hadn't really, honestly speaking, I haven't specifically addressed that point. I don't have a lot to say about it. I don't think that issue is addressed, or, or I, I haven't made a point one way or the other on that. It's, it's an issue which, which I had from my own experience, and so I, and this many times. Well, you know, if somebody has a suggestion that would enhance, but that would help address that, you know, I think that that's willing to be considered as well. Yes. Yeah, the thing I like is, is you could just do a simple comment. You don't have to do a full review and say, I both accept or reject. You can say, I don't like this part of the documentation. Well, so you don't have to put the effort there'll, in. I there'll be a lot of that, too. But anyway, uh, we're splitting hairs here in lots of ways. My, the, the, without getting into that level of detail, what I'm looking for is gathering more information. And I believe that uh, we, if we do it this way, we'll, we'll, we would get a lot more. That's, well, you know, <clears throat> I, I actually, I really like this, because um, I really do think that it would cause, me personally, I would be much more inclined to be a, an official reviewer, um, given all the information, being able to give, go, go through everybody's comments. What's this gentleman's name? Ed. Ed, yeah. okay. Review manager for the next library. Never again volunteer yourself. Anybody, Ed. any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> See what I was thinking about the don't dare? Exactly because this, <laughs> this is exactly what I meant. <laughs> when somebody okay. asks, what do you mean? Do you think people are, are, are don't want to give their reviews they're because, they're, 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 because they're, do you like think it. that, because they think that they're going to be called on to volunteer for something? No, because they're going to uh, get left out or to get some really, some oh. critics. Or, this, 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 yes, yes. Oh, sure. Absolutely. I think the point that if I post something, then all of a sudden I, I'm taking on a, a high profile or offering an opinion. And then, honestly speaking, on every mailing list, there's a number of people who jump in and make it unpleasant. 
It's just, it's, uh, it's just a factor, you know. Uh, the boost mailing list is much better. Uh, uh, it, we, the only thing, change I would make is to insist on real names. We pretty much do that now. The boost mailing system works great, but honestly, this is hard stuff. And we have disagreements all the time, and that's not going to go away. But I, I'm hoping that this would make the problem a little easier. But I, honestly, I'm not, I haven't directed towards that. It seems to me that one of the things that's going to happen, if I'm understanding how you're proposing this, is you're going to have kind of a set of boost candidates as well as boost servers. That's, I think that's a good way So we have a library of boost candidates. So people who are not on the main list, people who don't consider themselves part of boost developers, they're going to look at this candidates. This is interesting. I'm going to download this. And I am not going to be part of the formal review process, but just like an Amazon user, I'm going to go on there and say, well, uh, the documentation sucked, but once I got past that, then I had this problem. But once I got past that, it was okay. Right. And I think we're actually opening ourselves up to hearing from a much larger audience. They won't do as good a job in some sense as what, you know, somebody on, on the Boost Devil is. Oh, wait, wait, but in a different you... sense, they downloaded it because they expected it to solve an immediate problem. And so they may be less interested in some esoteric design issues and things like that, but they're really interested in did I really understand what the documentation said? Did it really work the way it was supposed to? Was it helpful? Right. And uh, you know, that's a whole group of people that, honestly speaking, I don't think we're really getting information from until it's way too late. OK, um, I'm way behind here, but whatever. Um, <laughs> so uh, here are the advantages I think we talked about. Uh, yeah, nothing new that we haven't talked about there already. Uh, I believe we'll have more boost libraries. I believe that it will be uh, easier to submit something. Uh, and I believe that we will get more stuff approved. We'll, we'll, we'll get more stuff weeded out. We'll just, it'll just make the process more expeditious. OK. Uh, another thing, to me, it's kind of a pity in boost, because I think that there's a lot of libraries that won't qualify for Boost because Boost, for example, uh, take the serialization library as a good example. Honestly speaking, to get accepted to Boost, it had to cover a really wide range. It had to do XML, for example, something I've never wanted to do. And uh, I only did it for one reason, is because <clears throat> for whatever reason, I decided that I was going to get a boost library in my name or die trying. <laughs> that's the only reason. That's the only reason. That, and he almost did die. Uh, no, well, it's, like, it's like a target. You know? He's 29. <laughs> Once you get your foot in, the harder you work to get out of it, the more it sucks you in. Does it mean you're actually 29 years old? What's that? You're actually 29 years old, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can go into that, and that's a real interesting discussion, at least for me to talk about, probably not for anybody to hear. But the, 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 the truth, the long and the short of it is, making a Boost library and getting it accepted by Boost is a lot harder than people think. It's just, and not harder, I mean harder from, let's call it an intellectual accomplishment, just the volume of work. I mean, and then, uh, as I say, the, the breadth of people you have to satisfy, whatever. I can envision a lot of people probably have li libraries they'd like to submit, but they know they won't submit them because they know they wouldn't be accepted because they don't cover a wide enough area, or they don't have every feature that they know that people are going to ask for. But uh, I can envision our accepted libraries having, what, what does CPAN have in it? 1,200 libraries? Some number like that. I could, I could, I could, like, I could I'd love to see 250 libraries there of all of some sort of certifiable quality, or some uh, meeting this minimum bar. And even though they wouldn't be qualified as boost libraries, I think that they'd find it. I'd like to see a library that uh, prints the date in Roman <coughs> numerals, uh, or prints the, writing, the, the, the uh, dollar amount on a check in five different languages. Is that ever going to be a boost library? I doubt it. But would it be a quick candidate here? Well, I could see a place for that. Thinking about uh, one thing as you, you are talking, uh, there was uh, a discussion about uh, about the, 
the logo, the boost logo. Uh, variation. Very <laughs> big extension. <laughs> Proposed for. <laughs> can, can, can somebody have a, some water or something? Because uh, I can yeah. actually talk a lot more than I anticipated. I'll get you something. Uh, oh, wait. Uh, and then, well, then there yeah. was the speaker gets the drink. Shall there be a uh, group cool. rejected or something? No, where they have a formal review and where they find a review manager, they have done such great work and they have fulfilled so many standards and they have produced such a good quality that this is a value in itself even, even if they are rejected. And who is, uh, should do a certification even for them? Okay, well, remember, and I didn't want to go back to this, but I, I basically defined the booth certification process and that would be the right to have the boost logo or whatever. But and that would be that would be the the, go, the, brat, the golden ring, huh? But I wouldn't say that there's if it fails to get uh, the boost certification, that that's necessarily a perjured characterization of the library. Uh, as I say, there's lots of things which can't be boost libraries which are still useful. And I'd like to have a place for them. Yes. Well, that's you hit it, and that's what I've tried to do. Okay, so uh, what would it take to implement this? Because uh, uh, it's also very present in my mind that we want, what I don't want to do is turn this into World War II or some giant deal. I'm, I'm really looking for an expedient, simple, incremental way to, to make this happen. So what, in order to implement this system, we would need a web form which generates the library status page. We would need some scripts for this library status page. And we need a designation of a person that, that subjects the library to the initial acceptance uh, review and does the checklist. That's all we, that's, we already have the source control system. We already have build systems that the, that the uh, uh, library proponent can select from. From my perspective, this is all we need and I think that it would be a transition that would not be too hard to take, too, too hard to do. Well, I agree with general premise that we need more information, but I also agree with Devin saying, why do we do this? Why not say, to be acceptable, you need to have SourceForge page, and we require you to do initial development and so forth, but then you can submit the library. Okay. Yeah, well, I, the, frankly, Source SourceForge is very interesting, and to me, it's an example of why the process doesn't work. If I go to Source, uh, SourceForge, to start with, there's a huge, I can't compare one thing to another. A lot of the stuff is documented. A lot of projects are just open. Some guy horsed around a little bit, and that's the end of it. I, I can't go there and have any confidence that I'm going to get something useful. That's the main problem. And that's, frankly, I looked at SourceForge carefully. I see the parallel. and. I, f I found it wanting. So what's going to stop this from becoming, you know, graveyard and source for this? That's what we added projects. It so could well, have a compiler no. You know, we, we've got the vault. It's got tons of abandoned projects. It's got all of that. I, frankly, there, you're, there's, there's nothing to stop it from that. The, the, the difference, I would hope, would be that with this library status page, it'd be pretty apparent if something hasn't been downloaded in four years. It'd be pretty apparent if 10 people have tried it and they found it wanting. Uh, yeah, it would be a graveyard, it would be dead. But at least, we wouldn't be eating the dead. That's the difference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 17,000. Okay, I think that, I think that C++ could do really well with 200. So, uh, I mean, 200 good ones. And anyway, um, but getting back to this now, now I'm moving, which Dave raised before, well, what's it going to take to do this? To, to implement what I've talked about now, my view is that this is all that would be necessary. Have you done any web development? Yeah. Have you de developed any web infrastructure ever? Just to, to the minimal extent I've had to do it. Okay. It's, I mean, it's a I, pain. I, I never wanted to learn about it, but I, 
it's neither did I. And it's I a big deal, actually. If you want to do something that scales, and this thing is going to be end up being big. Well, you know, one can hope. Um, yeah. I think you're missing an important piece. You have to capture. You have to capture that uh, the reviews process. You've got to have the you know the equivalent of the Amazon. Well, I you know that's not on your list. Well, there's two two aspects. One is the rating thing. Uh, actually, I did make one of those things for web. It was a pain in the neck. I didn't like it, but I made it work, and that was it. I, I think that that's easy to do. As far as the capturing the reviews, uh, that's my. I think that's easy to do. There's a lot of ways you can do it. The mailing list, have you do with it? The PHP forum. Uh, maybe even each developer gets to choose which one he wants to do. It turns out, by the way, that we have a look at the Gmail mailing list. There's 15 mailing lists for different boost libraries already, uh, and a lot of them are dead, but a lot of them are really active. So for those libraries, I mean, I would say the, li the library status page would just point to those lists that are already working. And so, uh, it, the issue of uh, the I'm I'm of the view that, and I I put. My estimate a number of stars is the difficulty or the amount of effort these tasks would take. And my view is that this is this would be doable for books. Uh, I think the very minimum is something I suggested some time ago in the boost list would be to use the, the bug tracker to track submissions and uh, allow people to comment on those submissions. So the, the track system, my personal opinion, I'm extremely pleased with it. It's a little slow, but from a functional point of view, it works great. We, people submit a bug. We have whole discussions about it. Other people chime in. People submit. And so frankly, from my perspective, uh, this, this uh, one of these links could be the, uh, the track system. I, you know, I, I, don't, I didn't want to get into that level of detail because I knew it would suck up a lot of time. And frankly, I'm really hoping to get agreement that this is the kind of framework we need before we looking to see <laughs> what tools we're going to use to do it. Yeah. What I'm wondering about is, is, or what I would like to see is the goal is any library placed in this state has the goal of becoming a certified boost library. That you wouldn't just submit it, it sits there for four years. And I, can't, I can't enforce it. You know, no, but I think you could if you said, okay, if we're trying to get more information, more reviews, but we're going to put a two-year time limit or something. If it, if it isn't accepted, then it drops well, you're, off. Well, I mean, there's a whole lot of like refinements you can do on this. I don't really want to go in. I mean, for example, maybe libraries not maintenance get, that aren't maintained get dropped from it. I don't know. But before we get into that, we have to agree to do it. <laughs> so that's what I'm looking for here. So, Robert, uh, just as a point information, I mean, that last one is actually a uh, abstraction above the actual uh, task. Designating it for, okay, Robert, huh, you're the person to verify that the minimum requirements have been met, upload to the index. Is that was easy. Yeah, there you go. No, no, there you go. <laughs> there you go. The question is, just like you've heard you. Sure, I'm, I'm aware how the system works. I run the, I run the system. <laughs> <laughs> so, how we actually have to design a system whereby we can actually sign up as volunteers for a couple of libraries or for a couple of weeks or a month uh, so that we can s split up the tasks here. Let's, let's that's really the biggest task. Well, you know, time. it depends how many submissions we have. If we get one submission a week and somebody has to check it off, maybe that's not too much. Let's worry about that when we see what happens. And if it turns, I, I mean, the worst thing, the best thing that could happen would be that we get so many good libraries that we don't know what to do with it. Is that, is that our problem? Is that, it, I'm not concerned about it. It's like, it's like, it's like, what happens if you make too much money? <laughs> yeah, I like that problem. <laughs> so, um, okie doke. That's the end of my... I think the problem is really uh, what happens when you can get way too many bad libraries. Too many what? Bad libraries. Yeah, bad library. Right. You know, and you were checking it off, but they just they meet the criteria. But the problem is now, if we get bad libraries, we don't really weed them out until it gets to the formal review. It's a very expensive process, and here we have a system for weeding them out, frankly, painlessly. The the people that test them will weed them out for us. That's and you hit it right on the head. From my perspective, I I see it as we're spending more time to get less output. 
and I believe the same amount of effort under this system will get more output for the same amount of effort. The statement you just made is we uh, uh, spending too much time. With any statistic, how many libraries were dropped because of lack of documentation, because of lack of test? My experience is not the case. I'm not. How many libraries have been rejected for formal review? Is that no? That's not. There are many different reasons, but what your minimum acceptance level is nothing. I mean, if that still means that you know, as many libraries were to be dropped during formal review, uh, uh, rejected. Uh, I disagree with that. That, uh, that, that's where we're going to disagree. I believe that it's, if, a, a review, uh, if a library is obviously not ready, it won't even get to formal review. I believe that the developer will actually decide he doesn't want it reviewed yet until he has a high probability of actually getting accepted. And now that the information is publicly available, he will not ask that it be reviewed until, in fact, it's apparent that it's almost a no-brainer. Not only that, he'll likely, if he's got a community of people that are using it, he'll likely be able to bring them over participate in the review once they've already, you know, right. developed some sense of authority and expertise in the library in their smaller domain. It's, it's, it's a good idea. Following up on that, it's much easier to, to write a review during the review period if I've already mostly written it and I'm just cutting and pasting some comments. Hey, you might even, maybe you already, maybe you, in a fit of, you got really frustrated with it, you, you, you did it on a Saturday night because it ruined your whole day, and that, that review is there available. Okay. And it's it can be drawn upon. So okay, that's uh, that's the end of my proposal for the formal review process. Uh, a lot of questions, a lot of talk. So I'm happy to move on to a more difficult topic. Something more difficult than this. It is. It's worse. Good. <laughs> okay. Oh, this isn't too bad. Uh, uh, testing. Uh, Here's my here's here's what we do about the testing. Whoops, I got a I got out of sync here. Damn. In this program, I must say it drives me to distraction. That's a polite way to put it. Well, let's uh, not go there either. I mean, um, okay. Uh, we run we have our trunk test where we test all the libraries which have been accepted as Bruce libraries. We test all the libraries against all the other libraries which are in an experimental state. I've railed against this. I'm not really going to belabor that. Uh, that's how we do it. Uh, an error in one library appears, might appear, and an error in libraries depends on that. A change in one library provokes testing on other libraries which depend upon it. Uh, testing can't test all combinations of compilers and build kinds. In this particular case, our test matrix shows different compilers. When I look at that, I can't tell whether it's for the, with a static, a static version of the library, or the DLL version, or whether it's debug or release. Uh, the testing occurs if the test setup, I want to see the testing occur on my machine if I'm going to use a library. Uh, and so I also believe our testing is not scaling as we have more library. I would like to run more tests on the serialization library. I can't really do it because it would be too big an imposition. So uh, that's a complaint I have about the current uh, testing setup. Uh, Boost tools, uh, I don't believe, are, are tested at, at the same level of frequency and rigor and everything that the libraries are. I think that they, any, anything that's a Boost tool should be subjected exactly to the same criteria that a Boost library is. It's good enough for library, and, this, and the tools that I have in mind are uh, BJAM, uh, CMake or CTest, uh, Boost, uh, Boost Book, the, the, the document and QuickBook, uh, those things. Uh, I tried to use those, and although I'm confident I could make, make Boost Book work, I don't really want to mess with it unless it's a no-brainer, because uh, <laughs> my brain is shrinking, and I just want to focus it on that stuff which is, I think, really important to me. So that's my situation about the testing. Now, what I propose to change on the testing is uh, that, I, and I talked about this before as part of the review, I would like to see when somebody downloads a Boost library or the whole of Boost library, they run the tests on their own machine, in their own environment, whatever it is, and, they, and we get a report on that. Uh, it's, it's been mentioned that we probably can't enforce that. Uh, I think that at least we can encourage that. Personally, I don't like, I'm willing to help people out, 
But, you know, here's a guy, he's not willing to run the test out of the box, but he's willing to bug me and ask me to post me his program, which is a thousand lines long, and ask me to tell me the serialization library has a bug in it. Well, you know, uh, that doesn't work for me. Uh, I would like to, and I think that if the other thing is we have uh, platforms that are not so widely used, but we don't have any, getting any testing on, on them at all. Uh, if somebody downloaded it for QNX, well, somebody did test QNX, but it happens very sporadically. Uh, Windows CE might be able to run uh, some of Boost. Uh, it would be interesting to get some feedback on that. It goes back to the same issue that I talked about in the review. I'd like to get more information about what people experience with the library uh, as far as testing is concerned. Um, so, uh, there's this last point addresses another issue. Uh, I know that uh, we've got the CMake system, the, C, the, the BJAM system. I think there was a move, I'm, I'm sure Dave will have a, Dave, Dave knows more about this than I do, but I'm not going to go too much into it. But what I do believe is that each library, the developer each library should, should be able to select the, the test system that he's going to use. And that the testing of all of Boost is just nothing more than the concatenation or composition of the tests of the individual libraries. At that point, uh, if we trend, if somebody comes up with a new tool, a better tool, well, for example, we have it now. Uh, people can generate their HTML documentation using any tool they want. There's no real reason to enforce that across the board. I would say the same argument uh, for for testing every library. I think it would be better if developers had a little more leeway and we had a way to permit tools to evolve. Now, or at least up until now, the, the changing of tools had to be kind of wholesale. And I think if we get more library, that's more difficult. There's just one, one issue with, that, with the testing system thing is that, is that if you want to be able to aggregate these results, you probably need some kind of uniform reporting from the right. tools. I agree that th this is this is not uh, this is not a trivial exercise. I'm, I'm not I don't know mean to say that, but I do believe, especially if we want to get more libraries and we also want to, a way to permit tools to evolve, uh, which I think that, that this is one thing that we should strongly consider. Um, let's I'm, I'm struggling. So, uh, testing one library, well, we pretty much got that. Uh, I, now, I, I, it seems to me like I'm the only person that does that, but does this, and that I can, I run the BGM testing on my own particular machine, and it generates a table similar to the one that's posted for the, all the libraries, just for my library on my machine, and I use that to check all my tests. Now, in my case, including variations, it's like that table is 250 lines deep. If you've only got 10 tests, Apparently, it's not, not a real big issue. But one thing that I do on my local machine, I test the serialization library against the next release. So I'm not testing against everybody else's experimental code. I'm just testing my own changes against the current release. So it's a control experiment. I'm changing one variable at a time, which is my library. Uh, the current trunk testing, and this is, as I say, I've railed against this, so I don't want to belabor it anymore. But it, it, from my perspective, it, it changes multiple variables simultaneously, and it, it makes the testing system less useful. But I, I've ceased to make a big issue out of it, because personally it's not a big issue for me anymore. I just test my library on my machine against the release. I changed my boost tree so that the, it's all the release tree except for the serialization library directories, and they're switched to the trunk tree. And then I just run the tests, and then I know that when I merge that to the release tree, it's almost, 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 almost sure to work. So, um, anyway, uh, the testing of the library plus pre prerequisites. Question. Uh, that, that's Robert, question. Yeah. Uh, for what it's worth, I tend to agree that trunk testing uh, is, is not optimal right now. I kind of like your scheme. I wonder uh, who objected to it and what did they say? Um, you know, honestly speaking, um, I don't think that, that my position was carefully considered to the extent that there was a real substantive objection to it. I think the major view was that nobody just wanted to deal with the hassle of making any change. Uh, 
Uh, I think actually implementing that scheme is a non-trivial exercise, and probably the basic issue was that nobody felt they had the time yeah. to invest in it. Well, let, let me put it let me put it in a different way. It was my proposal that somebody else make the change. Uh, so maybe that sums it up in a nutshell. Huh? Nicely done. <laughs> so uh, that's probably the single best explanation. But I would like, as I say, honestly, I would like to see more testing move to the people that download the library. I think it scales better. Uh, it would mean that testing resources are used on the libraries that are, that are being used. It would, be, it would mean that testing is being done on the, on the, on the compilers' environments that are actually being used. Uh, it would spread the load. Uh, so that's, I think, it's boost testing and boost review are the two pillars <laughs> of the three. There isn't a third one that, that makes boost stand out. But I, I believe that uh, both of those things are not scaling. And, uh, so I, I think the test re requires that rework. Now, there's one other little thing here. Remember, we've got this acceptance level. We've got boost candidates. It's a good word. It hadn't occurred to me. Um, and one downloads that, and he pastes it on top of his current boost tree. And what does he do? He runs the library. He runs those tests. He's running the tests on that library against his current boost release. That's exactly what I'm proposing that we do. And so whatever infrastructure is required, we will, in my view, already have it. So that's why I think I put testing one library as just two stars. It's not, shouldn't, in my view, shouldn't be a huge hill to climb. I do it on my own machine now. I don't know why anybody else can. So I think that um, that's worthy. I think that needs some more back and forth. But that's where I would like to go. Now, testing a library that projectors is kind of a trickier uh, proposition because if one library depends on another, then I've got to download and test them both. Uh, it turns out the VCHAMP system, which I use, if I, my library depends on the second one, uh, I believe that uh, I know that it'll build any prerequisite libraries. I don't know if we'll actually run the tests on the prerequisite libraries. I think it won't. But I would, like, won't. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would like to see that at least considered for discussion. Uh, but because I would like to see before some guy comes to the user list with a problem to know <coughs> he's really tested his stuff. So uh, the forwarding the user test results to the database, I would like to see uh, that somehow added in there. Um, testing in the trunk, um, run the library test on change library. I don't know what I meant when I said that, but there we go. Uh, testing for release, running the library test on all the libraries. So I see the testing. Uh, the testing for release is basically just a set of individual library tests, each one running its own test system. So uh, that's more of an implementation. Well, that is the implementation part. That's the task, task list. There's a lot of discussion that if this gets to the point where people really want to seriously think about this, then this is going to be one of those discussions we all really love um, about a lot of people telling other people what they should be doing. So, um, but I think, it's, from my perspective, it's important that we get to the point that we want to we want to see something like this happen. I'm glad there are no questions on that. So, um, deployment. Right now, Boost is deployed as a, uh, a giant group of well, it didn't start out as a giant group of libraries, and it's really not giant yet, but. Hopefully, it, it would get to the point where it might be considered giant. But, and I do hear quite frequently uh, that people say, ah, you know, I know there's something in the Boost library, but I just need a, a short thing like um, State Saver for the I.O. or, uh, I don't know, the Static Assert. Or, and now I have to download a, what is it? A, I just downloaded it the other day, a 49 megabyte package, and then unzip it, and whatever. You know, and all I want is a static assert. And uh, what I envision, we've got our boost candidates. Well, remember, once the library's been accepted, it's in there already, and it could be downloaded one at a time, just as it could before it was accepted for the formal review. However method, whatever method existed before to deploy that one library will still exist. So a uh, person that wants just one library will have the opportunity to just bring down the libraries that, <laughs> that, that he wants. So I think that that's a facility that we will not be able to avoid providing in some manner 
in the future. Uh, we have a tool that already can provide exactly what we need. I, it just, I made this whole talk, and then I set it aside, give myself a break, and then before the last, the week before, last week before, I went back through it with a fresh mind, and I said, well, before I do this, I should investigate BCP. I experimented with it, and I thought, man, that's fantastic. So I can take any, any library that I want, and suppose a Boost Candidate library, which depends on other Boost stuff, and uh, if a developer submits a, a candidate library, and he wants to create a downloadable package, which includes that library plus the Boost stuff that it needs to run, the developer can use BCP, create a zip file, which would have just that library and its prerequisites. And then that package, the, uh, the user is going to test it, can download it, and paste it over his Boost directory, and he can test it without making the huge commitment that a lot of people see uh, as being necessary to, to boost. So I believe that that would give a lot of people who are reluctant to in, engage in what looks to be a big project uh, a better incentive to try, especially uh, to try something, especially if there's one library that for whatever reason they really want to try, but they, they, just, they, just, they just don't want Metaprogramming and wave and spirit and they don't they don't want to look at they just they just found this one thing because Google showed up that one library and right now we don't really have much to offer. Them. Bad news is they're probably going to get the metaprogramming library no matter what. They the might. Library. <laughs> <laughs> but the good thing is they won't know it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I, I did discover that that uh, PCP does deliver a heck of a lot more than you ask for because of which could, depending on how the developers set things up, but that, that's kind of the most minor detail. But I was surprised, because I thought, when I, when I saw what BCP did, I was thinking, oh, no, man, this, nobody can make this work in a reliable way. So it's one more thing that I need that turns out to be a hack that doesn't work, which is the thing that I waste half my life on. I, so I, I dipped around, I said, I'm not going to mess with it. I finally did it, and I, I was blown away. It's just perfect. So that right away wiped out one of my tasks. So anyway, I want to see Boost deployable on a library by library basis. Uh, in a someday in the distant future, over the horizon, I would like to see the Boost distribution disappear as it is now, and basically just people be able to pull down uh, the libraries that they're interested in. And uh, I think that that's way premature to think about that. That would be, I would hope to see that evolve to that. I certainly don't want to advocate that now. But that just gives you a little insight to where my brain's headed. Yeah. Um, as a, essentially an internal packager, I actually find the, the monolithic state of boost useful. It means that I, could, I can get a single package that has been built and has some chance of all these pieces working together. And if I have to go pick one thing called A, right. I'm, be, I'm likely to get conflicts. And it's going to be I, much I, much I, Honestly, at this point, I don't want to advocate for doing away with that in any way. Uh, I think and it's, it's a goal I would like to see us evolve to, but perhaps it's, it's never going to be possible, but it's not central to my argument here. Um, I see the argument of, and I actually what I see in practice happening, some guy says he Googles and he needs a singleton, you know, and then he says boost. And then he goes in the website, he sees a library page, he sees a bunch of people downloaded it, he goes, looks at the documentation, looks bad, he downloads that piece, and then uh, the, the other pieces that are necessary, he likes it, and then he gets, he goes somewhere else because he's like always under the gun to really do some real work. And then he needs another library, he does the same thing. He's done this three times, he says, you know, I'm going to save time by getting the whole thing. And so I can, I think that many people get into Boost, myself, well, myself included. I couldn't build it, but I could pull down some of the header libraries and start using them on an experimental basis. And I think that by facilitating this process, that would be good for Boost. And I think it would move longer term in the direction I would like to see us go. Okay, moving along. All right. Uh, the release process, I, I think, is too more painful than it should be. I think everybody would agree with that. I think it's improved huge amounts. I think it's going to continue to improve. 
I don't have too much to, more to say about it. Uh, I think that uh, we're just on the right track with that, and, and it's improving every time, and there's just no way to make that improve faster. Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to say something about that. I'll assume not. <laughs> I want to say something about the point release issue. One of, one of the reasons that we don't have point releases right now is because it implies too much labor for the, for the uh, overall boost library factor. It would, and it would be acceptable and, and better. It, I mean, we do need to have point releases of individual libraries, and if individual library authors could point release their own libraries, then that kind of stuff would be, would be possible. Well, well what about this, Dave? Let's just suppose that when you, uh, yeah, if the, when, a li when uh, an individual developer, whether it's a candidate or whether it's the, the release one, um, he makes a real change and he said, oh, this is really an improvement. This is the one I want to see distributed. He runs BCP and generates a new zip file right there, even if it's an official boost library. And somebody, if somebody has a complaint, well, they can download the, the latest one for that particular library. Well, okay, I have better ideas for tomorrow night. Okay, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I want to solve the same problem, so yeah, we're okay. on the same page. And I, I'm kind of, I, I'm, I, I'm trying to not get too, in, I'm trying to convince you guys the problems are solvable without getting sucked in too much about actually trying to solve. So, um, because, you know, it's easy, that's a different problem. Well. <laughs> <laughs> so, any case. Um, anyway, I, I believe that this de deployability of one li li library at a time is useful for the candidate libraries. I believe it's useful for the candidate release issue. The mechanism, whether it, how it occur occurs, whether it's, it's a zip file or whether it's Git or whether it's this, I'm unconcerned with right now. But I think it's very handy to be able to, to uh, get the latest version of the library, whether it's a candidate one or whether it's an official boost one. Uh, and the yes. Uh, quick question: Is you mentioned like the sort of like mini review process in order for something to become a candidate? Is that integral to your system, or could you just have anybody put their C++ library? I would like to have it pass a gatekeeper to guarantee that it meets the checklist. But for but for what benefit? Any time someone goes and sees a library on there, they'll see that it clearly doesn't. Have criteria and let us throw away. Kind well, of. you you could yeah, I mean, you know you could make that argument. I mean, my preference would be a gatekeeper. You could you could say you could make your argument too, but I'm you know we'll never know until we try it. So well, there, there's been other communities that do similar things. Well, you know what I'm afraid of is source forge because that's a perfect example of what I like to see avoided. And it, I, the many libraries there don't meet what my what I consider even the minimal standard. And it's true. They just sit there. They die. They uh, which is a really, uh, it's kind of amazing how how smoothly this thing works as a platform. And one of the things it has is is plugins. And so plugins are essentially libraries. So there's integrated with this thing. You, there's a place you can go to say find some more plugins. And and so there's a central repository, and you can give it some search criteria. You type in the search criteria, and then you can have them sorted by, you know, number of stars they get, by number of uh, uh, people that have actually done ratings. So not just the average number of stars, but the number of people that have done the ratings. So if you only if you have one five star review, it's not very interesting. Um, you know, there's there's certainly a lot of flotsam in there, but it's very easy to ignore the flotsam because I can sort it so that it falls to the bottom of the list, and uh, it's been very successful. Okay, and water for my mill. Um, Okie doke. Uh, as far as deployment is concerned, and here I, I listed the tasks. They're not really much different, if any, than the tasks we're doing now. The only thing I've really added is the, the thing we already added in the review, the ability to deploy one, the latest version of one library and paste it up <coughs> onto your, your setup. One thing I, what I envision really is that people who want to use Boost they download, I'm going to call it the Boost Skeleton, which has the absolute minimum in it, which would be pretty small. And if, at that point, you would have a place to paste on top any candidate libraries or any certified libraries that you want to try. And so we would have the, the library by library deployment option. And uh, that's, that's, that's the only difference. That, and other than that, we'd have everything else the way we have it now plus that.
Yes. Um, might address the point that to address the point that you made you need a gatekeeper. I don't agree in that point. Uh, I agree that we should have high standards. We already have high standards and they can be increased. But um, we should address the people who are contributors at Bus as very as competent and uh, gifted people. So they uh, we rely on that they fulfill this criteria that they My point is, we need a system for gathering information. I really don't want to get into you know, a lot of the details about it. There will be a lot of opportunity to decide the, the details about who. No, well, this is not a detail. This, this is a question I'm of the views the, the it's a long What people are who contribute this? And I say uh, they are creative people who want to contribute, and they are aware of the standards, and they are passionate about quality. So, uh, okay, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, if we set it up and we get that far, and we'll open it up, try it out, and see what happens. And if it turns out we don't need a gatekeeper, we're done. If it turns out we get a lot of boneheads contributing a lot of stuff, thinking that, uh, like, you know, phone sex or whatever, you know, we'll have a gatekeeper. Right? I don't know. Uh, but we don't have to worry about that now. I think that that, that that question will resolve itself as soon as we have some experience with it. So you know, I, don't, I don't think we really have to you know, spec debate it too much, because even if we came to a conclusion we would, we would, and we discovered it was wrong, we'd change our mind. So I, a lot of the questions that I think people are concerned about, in large part, are as soon as we get more facts available, the questions disappear. And probably we have a whole bunch of different ones that we, we failed to, to think about right now. Another point. I find this session very uh, interesting, very exciting, and I have a lot of ideas. And also, I have thought about the thing about Boost and why it is broken for the last uh, six months, about all the time in between. And I have a lot of ideas. All right. And I would like to do a proposal. Um, but it, now it's late. It's actually at six o'clock a.m. in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> time to go to stand up again. Um, but I, I would like to do a proposal uh, in a form of a talk, 50 minutes talk. Well, I'm not the person to ask, but and maybe it's possible to integrate it in uh, my talk I, tomorrow. Yeah. I should say that th there's going to be more on You'd this You'd like subject. to do that, that at this BoostCon? Is that what you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. And what's your talk tomorrow on? My talk is on uh, law-based testing. Okay. It, I mean, do you have you have time for this other thing in there? Um, I mean, it's 90 minutes, right? right? It would be unfortunate to to uh, to cut the, the 15 cool. minute out of the other talk. Uh, what what are you what are you talk? I, I, think, I, I think it's very exciting and a very a very important point. Why don't we do this? Why don't you talk to the organizers? Because I can't really okay. help with that. Number one. Uh, number two. To start with, it's great that I think people really interested in. This issue, and um, finally, uh, oh yeah, uh, Dave has got. Uh, that's kind of an interesting story. I'm not going to get into, but Dave's got a session tomorrow, which is very closely related to this, and which will probably, if you attend that, then you'll probably your your exposition and comments will probably not be 15 minutes, but another 15 minutes, because I know he's got some interesting ideas, which. Uh, I think this is probably working out to be a good introduction to. So this is a big topic, and uh, you'll, there's going to be lots of opportunity. Here's, the, here's, here's what I suggest. I, there will be opportunity to talk during my presentation because, frankly, I don't even have any slides right now. I, I'm going to put together a few guideposts tonight, but, but really I have some ideas to present and, and some progress reports to give, and I was hoping to have a fair amount of discussion. So there'll be room for that. There's also, another session called the with, Future of Boost, is there not? Yep. Separate, separate issue. Okay. Um, we're we're pretty. Our schedule is booked fairly solid 
here uh, at BoostCon. So if we're going to find more time to talk about this stuff, we're going to have to do it at in informal times in between the in between the scheduled times. Um, one of the things the the Meadows has offered us to um, to buy a bunch of hors d'oeuvres and stuff if we want to hang out one other evening in the Hafter Lounge. They also there's also a room downstairs that might be more suitable to this, and I think we should have like a group of interested people get into a get into a discussion uh, downstairs there. So it's right off of the, the breakfast room. There's a there's a little room that they're, they'll let us use. Not so small. Um, it's actually pretty big. Uh, um, so my, my proposal is, I haven't decided yet when we're going to take them up on their their offer of free hors d'oeuvres, but I'm thinking tomorrow night after my talk might be a good I idea. People have to be willing to stay up late. That's the only deal. Um, okay. Any, any reactions? Well, I think Programmers willing to stay up late? Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe they should serve beer. I mean, just think if we were serving beer at this, you know? Uh, well, that would be, it'd be like twice as much fun. Well, you can order your beer there. I mean, <laughs> it's just you might have to pay for it. Uh, yeah, I would probably pay. I would probably buy everybody a beer so they would sleep. Okay. Um, I actually, it looks like I'm going to finish not too late. So uh, that's actually pretty promising. Uh, support. Uh, the same issue on the uh, user list come up all the time. Uh, you know, the current release of the... Uh, the I, I still envision the library status page as being a central, central place for all the information that's gathered about the library. The track system for me, I think, has worked extremely well. I don't know what it took to set it up. I get the impression it wasn't a huge proposition. Matter of fact, I, the, the, what I call the library status page is really inspired by the track system page for a library. Um, and I would, and perhaps that, 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 uh, that function might be fulfilled Detroit. by the, the, the uh, you know, the track items that you post for every, the, the for whenever anybody has a bug or enhancement for a library. Yeah, tickets. Tickets. Yeah. But it turns out there that people also post enhancements, suggestions, problems, and then I answer them there, and it actually becomes, uh, sort of a specific mailing list for the one particular library. Yeah, no, that, that works, and that's what it's supposed to be for. But you said library status page, and that there's a page for the library on the track, and I don't think we well, have that. No, what I really meant to say was that information uh, is part of the information that is, should be accessible from the library status okay. page. In other words, or in, whether it's integrated into the page or whether it's through a link, or at that point, I don't know, but it's part of the repository of information that every library I see is, is, is being useful uh, to gather. So I think that works well. I, I actually don't think there's there's a heck of a lot to change there, and I'm happy with that. Um, I want to unify the track page with the library status page, or maybe unify is the wrong word, just make sure that one's accessible for the other. Or it, it, it's a, I want a central spot for all the information uh, that corresponds to a particular library. Um, no task maintenance. Uh, the same thing, you know, uh, the, 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 the track page and the library status, it's, it, it's just the same thing as it is now. I don't see any major change to that. The only thing is, one thing that I would like, or I do like about this is, you wouldn't have on the user list everything with every library. You would really only have, uh, you would have almost like a separate mailing list for every library. You might want to think about cross-posting them on, on the other list, or that's even at this point that's a detail. But I like the very idea of having a thread, threads on, on, on each particular library available. This means that even if we do get to 250 libraries, we wouldn't have a user list uh, with <laughs> 250 libraries being discussed on the same list. And it's, you can just think about the, the current system you know, would scale, would work better this way. The current system that we've been doing and putting it all on the same list has been okay, but it just can't, it just can't continue if we want to keep expanding. That's my view. Okay, miscellaneous tools, Is tasks? projector updating? Oh, excuse me. I'm, yeah, I was just checking to see if you guys were watching. <laughs> were we? Uh, apparently. 
LPA, so nothing new there. Maintenance, I don't really have a lot to say. I think maintenance actually works pretty well. Uh, some libraries, you know, aren't being maintained as they should. Uh, that's, and there's been discussion about that. Uh, to start with, it'd be interesting to look at the status page and see if people are really using those libraries. Uh, if they're not really being used and they're not being maintained, or only by, it's really not a problem. If it turns out they're being used a huge amount, even in spite of the fact that they have some anomalies, well, maybe it's not a big issue either, or who knows. Uh, I think just the fact having more information would be helpful for making all kinds of decisions. A lot of the problems with the disputes on the mailing list is they, they really revolve around the fact that there aren't enough facts available. And I, I would hope that just gathering more information would make a lot of those discussions a lot easier or unnecessary. Uh, unsupported uh, libraries, they could, we could decide just by looking at statistics that an unsupported library, it would stay there, but maybe it wouldn't be an official boost library anymore. It might not be included in the official release. Uh, people would still be able to get, the few people that still use it would still be able to get it, but maybe we don't want to include it in the giant tarball. We, we, here we have an escape clause, which is kind of a graceful exit from a situation that's changed. We don't really, right now, we don't really have something like that. Uh, there is, for example, uh, an interesting case did come up uh, as far as a state machine. Somebody, we went through and, and approved a state machine as part of Boost, and a year later, a guy came up with a very similar library whose implementation a lot of people uh, like better, and I could envision a situation where then for a while both libraries are in there, and then as it becomes apparent that it, if it does become apparent that uh, one is falling into disuse, then we would just drop the one and leave it in the where it was, and nobody would be uh, hurt that much, and we would be kind of be a graceful way to transition and still keep the official boost. Uh, distribution lean and mean, as lean and mean as it can be, or at least mean. And you can do that by getting more statistics, is what you're saying. More yeah, more if we have no more, in, more, a uh, whole lot of the dispute, whenever you have a dispute, at least 50% of the time it's because you don't have enough facts. And by getting more facts, it would just help a lot. Uh, I would love to know, uh, by the way, uh, I, the serialization library is that one thing about it intrigues the heck out of me. I have no way of knowing whether the number of users is 50 or 50,000. I have, I, if I, I would love to know the number of people that downloaded it, and, and that's really what, and the number of people that tried it and decided not to, decided not to use it, and the number of, uh, that to me would be gold. Uh, I, if, if I look at, let's suppose for the sake of argument that Boost were a commercial enterprise, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put something out there and not really know what what the demand is. Uh, and you know, <laughs> 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 using stitch shirt footer. What? Uh, uh, standard shirt pointer. I have no idea how many people are using it. Uh, well, I, I would love to know. I would love to know. And uh, I would all. Uh, so I would hope that this statistics page would give me some feedback on that. <laughs> because honestly, if I knew that only 50 people were using it. That would really diminish my motivation to fix them. On the other hand, if I know that 50,000 people are, uh, I would kind of feel bad if I didn't fix them. So that would, and by the way, for the uh, developer to know that his library is being used by, by 10,000 people or 50,000 people, I mean, that's a huge incentive to keep the thing maintained, to submit the library in the first place, to undergo the incredible amount of effort it, it takes to make something like this work. Well, where, where did Blood from Boost make commercial? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. Um, you can't exactly pull it from Boost. Yeah. I mean, now, yeah. the, uh, OK, so Somebody actually, um, I, I, <laughs> I'm going to just leave a sort of a parting shot here. Uh, I guess there's no questions. Uh, I have a, a quick I question. Actually have a question. Do like Boost Dogs have Google Analytics or anything on them so you can at least see if, how if many this current they, they do not have that now. Okay. Uh, I, I, that had been proposed. Uh, it's worthy of discussion. Um, I don't know. It doesn't need discussion. Somebody just needs to do it. Yeah, well, well, I guess there were some ob objections about people being concerned about Google collecting information from Well, them, actually, this, 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 so. this could be delegated to each individual developer uh, and let him decide whether he wants to do it or not. Yeah. Uh, that's actually, a, to me, a very interesting idea. But it would only give me the information on the people that browse the docs. 
online. Yeah. So it would it would be some and, and actually now that you mention it, uh, in a now that I talk about what it would do. When I first saw it, I hadn't I didn't know anything about it, but I put uh, Google Analytics on my own web pages. Um, it, of course, it never gives you everything you want, but I do see right away it's so much better than nothing. Yeah. And um, so right away, I'm inclined to put into my uh, matter of fact, I'm not going to say right here. I'm going to promise to do that into my HTML pages. I'm going to paste in the Google Analytics just to just to demonstrate that it's it's easily doable. I'm pretty sure that the website does have some Google Analytics on it. I'm but, not sure where they. Where but my documentation yeah, does. But anything that's on the website gets that added. I think. I don't think so because I think you have to add it to every page. Yeah, uh, there's there's a framework that generates that generates the outside parts of the pages, uh -huh. and so it may well be injecting it into headers well, and footers. Well, now, it's interesting because nobody's described to me how to access that thing. So maybe that's the magic that's missing. Okay, that's your job. My whole life is driven by people that tell me that stuff's easy to do. Well, now, now that you bring that up, <laughs> So you, you've been very vocal here about how you're basically asking other people to do work. <coughs> um, I, I think that's what you've been saying. You certainly haven't been That's comic about. relief, really. I mean, okay. I, well, I mean, here, here's the thing. I've been around the open source world a long time, and I know that these, these kinds of things do not get accomplished unless the people with the strong visions and the passion about, about seeing them solved are actually putting their butt on the line and committing hours and, you know, sweat to it. And, you know, I mean, that's part of the reason that I've, I've been working all night, or the part of the reason I don't have slides for tomorrow right now is because I've been doing that sort of thing for my proposal. And uh, as long as you're, you, you have to get at least beyond the comic relief or, or this stuff isn't going to go anywhere beyond good ideas. Okay. Um. That's not a surprise to me, but anyway, and I don't have anything to say about that right now. So the only thing that I'm going to talk about, just as, a, as I say, just food for thought, because it's a, it's it just it's it's just the kind of thing that's going to generate a huge number of opinions and no discernible result. And I'll leave that in order just to leave the pot boiling. I just placed on my version of the library status page a spot so that somebody can put their advertisement. And uh, I can easily see into the test library status page that uh, a company which sells their own test software would be really interested in uh, signing up for that. Uh, serialization library, I get, I, get, I get mail like once a month from somebody who's got a better one. Well, here's your chance. Uh, you know, I, uh, I see, uh, I, the only problem is, and actually, I can see that this could have potential to actually uh, be a fundraiser, and that would give a whole new dimension to the opportunity of things to dispute. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that would give you guys, you know, those of you who don't have your fill, then you've got a whole new territory to conquer. So I think that's the end of my presentation. If anybody, I, I, honestly, I hope nobody has any more questions. And, uh, well, uh, you know, honestly, I'm not, I don't know what else to ask, what else to say. And I think that I, but I would anticipate a lot of people might talk to me afterwards or talk amongst yourselves because I know that people are really interested and I know that people here have a lot to say even though they might, uh, how should I say, feel intimidated by my bombastic delivery. Somebody else ask him what he's going to do. <laughs> Go ahead. I have no question. Uh, All right. But, but uh, I, uh, I'd like, like to thank you for your talk. For me personally, it was very interesting. Uh, very, I'm very inspired on the topic. Mm -hmm. And it generated a lot of ideas that I wanted to share. Yeah, okay. And I think that uh, we'll say, you know, honestly, when I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divert a little bit. When I propose this, I didn't really want to do it. I just felt that it was really something somebody had to do because there's all these complaints and suggestions going around, but there was really never any framework to paste them on to kind of consider the whole thing. So I thought about that. I looked at what we got, and I tried to 
and I really tried to make a proposal, I don't expect that for us to end up with exactly what I proposed by a long shot. But I do believe that uh, we, and I honestly didn't have any idea that this would be, I got a couple comments when I got off the plane saying, you're going to tell us what's wrong with Boost, huh? That's a quote uh, from two different people who didn't even collaborate. So I was extremely um, prepared. What do you expect with, the talk, with that title? Huh? What do you expect with that title? <laughs> well, I don't know. You were shocked by that question? Um, no, actually, it was the presumption behind the question. So, okay, I'm all, and I thank you for coming. I know it's late. I ran a little bit over, and uh, I enjoyed talking about this. Everybody loves to hear themselves talk. I'm no different. And um, I'm sure we'll have a lot to say about this. Thank you.